All righty. Hello, everyone, uh, both in the room as well as online. Thank you so much for joining us for our, um, I guess, well, it's a RAL seminar, but it's our inaugural um, seminar specific to our Minority Serving Institution Ambassador Pilot Program that we're doing both um, within RAL and across the organization with the support of NSFN CAR's Office of DEI. Um, so certainly thank you to that team as well. And so today, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Amy Yaboa Kwakume, affectionately known as Dr. A, who is a daughter of Africa, a scholar, a filmmaker, a data scientist, and an associate professor of Africana Studies in the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University, which is a historically black college and university. She holds a PhD in African-American Studies, two master's degrees in sociology and African-American studies, and certificates of data analytics from Harvard Extension School and the University of Massachusetts. She is also a Andrew Malone a New Direction Fellow, an NSF NCAR Innovator Fellow, and a White House Initiative HBCU All-Star Campus Mentor. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Amy. I think we've seen each other now in like three different states, uh, Hawaii, Colorado, and DC. Um, so that's been cool to kind of connect with her throughout um, and work on some very innovative research. And so today, Amy's talk is titled, Can You Hear Me Now? Closing the Data Gap Through Community Engagement and Applied Research. Um, very fitting for us all here. So please join me in welcoming Dr. A. Thank you. Thank you all for being here online and in person. Um, I, it's not an understatement for me to say that NSF NCAR, corrected, um, has changed my life. I was a humanist, still am a humanist, but being introduced to the Innovator Program opened up a whole new world. I mean, for a whole new earth and atmosphere, right? And I am forever grateful for the opportunity. I have, well, I was granted to be Innovator Fellow and now as the RAL Ambassador, um, the first at the last, I hope. <laughs> More to come soon. Um, I'm excited in this new journey um, to be a part of this new part of NSF NCAR. So thank you. Um, some of you may have seen part of this presentation during Data Commons. Um, I've um, adapted a little bit um, and I want to go more in depth as far as the question as far as applied in community engagement. What does that look like? What does that mean? And kind of what am I doing as a humanist with all this environmental stuff, right? Um, but thank you again. Thank you for NCAR. Thank you, NSF, UCAR, um, my Howard family, my Innovator Hub family, which is Curtis, Maria, Ag, Keith, Forrest. So I think for three years we've been talking monthly on, uh, online. So thank you and them for my students who are not here. But we're here this summer. And just left. So, and my family was watching. I, I sent the text so they should get the message to watch too. So, um, let me get started. Can you hear me now? Closing the data gap through community and applied research. Um, so, two quick surveys if you are online or in person, if you can switch to this um, short Slido engagement, I hope to um, get information about. Um, you can put in the link. I'm putting in the link and then the number 3391100. And I want you to rank. Priority, one being the highest, these four issues. What is, what's the most urgent? Whether it's education, climate, unemployment, crime. What are the most urgent? Um, from one being the most urgent to you, and four being the least urgent. They're all urgent, right? But which one is your number one? Take about five seconds just to rank them the best as you can. And I'm gonna just uh, change screens. So we can see the results. Oh, there we go. Interesting. I'm at NCAR. Most people are saying climate. <laughs> uh, I'll take five, two more. We have five so far. Oh, 13, sorry. Take two more. 15? OK, we're just 15. So interesting. So for those who are in NCAR in this space, um, climate is number one. I, com I completed the same activity with high students in New York, um, and the number one. Um, was crime, right? I did this activity in DC um, with some students and it was education, right? And it's interesting, depending on who's in the room, um, the pressing issue differs, right? N you know, we're not surprised about that. But for me, all four of these things are number one. They're somewhat all related if we, if we think about it, and I'll talk more about that. Um, second question, if you're in the same survey, uh, there's a question too. 
Okay, maybe I can answer the question too. Question two is, I want you to rank um, of these, these four issues, heat, water, energy, air. Which one is the most pressing issue? Is it extreme heat? Is it uh, water quality? Is it energy burden? Air quality, which is the most pressing issue from your perspective, in your family, in your neighborhood? Give me about five more seconds on that. Okay, water seems to be high for people in Boulder. Oh, I heard about the wildfires. Uh, so I'm just seeing that air is number two. It's definitely hot outside, the heat and energy. I know solar is very big here. So again, depending on who I'm speaking to in the room, this may change. So for students who are in Flint, Michigan, water, right? If you have my students who are in um, Baltimore, it's heat, they have asthma, right? Also air. Um, so these things change, but for me, I would say one is all this for me. One of the things all these are all related. When it's hot, um, the air has issues, and then my air conditioner is running, right? And then as far as me being able to either buy bottled water or drink water from the pipe, I still have issues there as well. Right. Um, so thank you for participating in that. I'm going to go back to the um, presentation. And, and what I want to focus on is the fact that depending on who you're speaking to, who's in the room, who you're working with, um, I think as scientists, as researchers, uh, and many times we're in our own bubbles, uh, we may not be able to truly understand what people's priorities are based upon their local environment. Um, and I'll get more into de detail with that. Can you hear me now? Is anyone familiar with the 2002 advertisement on Verizon? Can you hear me now? All right, this idea that connectivity was the priority. You had to be connected. You had to be within the scope of um, someone being able to call you, having service, like that was a priority. Fast forward to 2023, last year, um, Beyonce was trying to break the internet, right? So at one point, the concern was being connected, right? Having access. And then now it's like just breaking it, like it's going beyond the sphere, um, not just um, living on Earth, but going into outer space, going into a whole other uh, sphere where we see Bezos and crew building their own spaceship. Um, but people's priorities are shifting. Some of, us, some of us have to stay here. Some of us are trying to go to another planet, right? Some of us are modeling a whole different universe. And interestingly, we're all still on the same Earth, right? But people's priorities are shifting so fast with access to data. Right. And in many cases, for most people, that's great. It's awesome to have cool algorithms, GitHub, like all, these, all, all, all this tech is awesome. But for, for many people, they're not connected. They, they don't have access. They don't have technology. So people lack computers. So where do we talk about these communities who are not on the grid? I'm from the Bronx, New York, and I love the Bronx. Um, but one of the most traumatic events that happened to the Bronx a couple years ago was the Bronx fire. I think the Bronx fire, for me, becomes a very strong example of how um, crime, housing, education, environment, climate all become number one at once, right? Um, so the Bronx fire, it was a fire that unfortunately burned part of the building. Um, many people passed away, and this also deals with immigration as well. The family that was um, impacted was an immigrant family. And someone went social media um, and posted a raw response to what was happening. Um, it's very raw, so raw that I kind of, kind of start some things out. But they were able to capture this interconnected, uh, social, scientific, emotional, immigration, economic, um, employment reality that many people are facing. Uh, the right author says there should be no reason why a person who's paying rent, living in a building, should even need a F space heater. But here we are in 2022, M got a F metaverse, and are, t and are talking about traveling to Mars. We're in the Bronx, where it's considered the poorest country um, in America. 19 plus people, including children, were killed because of a space heater, right? Our Bronx five victims perished because of systematic racism and climate injustice. And I know you all hate me when I say this, but it's true, right? So we see this Bronx fire becoming this um, example of climate, economics, immigration, um, poor judgments, policy, capitalism, um, mortality, health, all at once. And the people who lack, let's say, the research or the data to be able to support, 
are just are just emotional and are just left to deal with some of what um, now is becoming an issue everywhere as far as fires. So I think the, the science of wildfires is there, but the reality of Bronx fires and house fires and um, apartment fires is also still there, right? So, so where's the science in that? So I can say a little bit about myself, getting you know, from the Bronx. Um, I, have, I work at Howard, I'm a teacher. Um, I'm a direct data science program. I um, work in history, data science, um, gender, also with innovation. I have degrees more than a thermometer. Um, but I think for me, what makes me excited about being part of NCAR and being with innovators in RAL is the fact that I will never forget my zip code, right? So those who are in data science, numbers are numbers, but my number that I love is 1046. That's my zip code. And this uh, categorical variable, right? Uh, category for location, not a real number. Um, it's very interesting. The zip code where I come from, so it screens a bit. Talk about where I'm from. Uh, generally speaking, where I'm from, the average income is about $20,000. $20, uh, most people do live, uh, as a certain amount of people live in poverty. The household size is about three. Right? Generally speaking, um, uh, those who are married, less than half families in these areas are not married. I'll zoom in a bit if you can see that. Here we go. All right. So about uh, demographic as far as housing, uh, most people are living in uh, multi-units. Right? Most people rent. There's not much ownership where I'm from as far as home ownership. Uh, and that's one more education. Education. So about 78% of individuals have high school degree. 15% have a bachelor's degree. And English is really not the main language, bless you. Um, and about almost half the population is of foreign-born um, status, right? And I say this all to think about when it comes to innovation and STEM and science. When I look at my neighborhood, um, living there, and now thinking about the science I know, um, being in an area where there is a reservoir, where there is water, um, I've never thought about being close to that water body. What does that mean? I've never thought about urban heat islands. And I, I, got, I, I learned a lot about that through, again, being a part of NCAR. And this is a map from 2019. Um, and in the past three years, we've seen it get hotter, right? So it's gone from orange to a little bit more red over time. Right? But growing up in the Bronx, you don't think of these things. Um, you don't think of how this impacts my energy bill, how this impacts my access, how this impacts my, my water bill. If I have to turn the hydrant on, just keep cool. Right? Things that are um, all related to my lived experience. So I pivot a bit to RAL and what do you all do here at, at NCAR. And I, I love the, the homepage where it says, we continually expand the reach of actual earth sciences. And then my question is, who are we reaching to? Right? Um, the idea that data definitely is everywhere. Um, we have a satellite, you can kind of see everything, but are we really seeing everyone? All right? Are we really hearing everyone's story? Are we really thinking about, again, fires? Um, at one level, there's a sense of um, fires that happen in mountains and spaces and droughts of volcanoes, but are we thinking about apartment fires right? as much as we think about fires that exist here? And then to go to innovation, right? agriculture, food, air quality, um, aviation, climate, human health, and these categories. And I love, the, I love the tech that exists around the innovations that um, exist in RAL. Um, and, many, and many of this tech deals with data, right? Um, so you may have algorithm that deals with climate, that predicts some type of health outcomes. But the question is, what if my community isn't counted, right? My neighborhood in many cases, when it comes to the census, um, many people don't participate as much. Right? The idea of trusting um, the survey or the researcher isn't there. Right? So I'm not giving data. So the question becomes, the algorithm that you created that exists with um, um, food, uh, food, food insecurity is there. Right? Air quality is an issue. Human health is an issue. Um, how do I use these algorithms when I'm not in the data? Right? How do I apply what you've um, created right, when I don't see myself in the numbers? I'm not counted. Right? When it comes to re re renewable energy um, and, the, and the technology, what if I don't have a computer, right? What if in the LLM, the, the dominant language is English? I don't speak English, right? How do I apply what's being created 
to be able to impact and address my lives, my life and our family's lives, but also how do we close the gap? I think that's kind of really the, the, great, the, the bigger question. Um, we have all this technology, all this data, um, but there are still areas that are not covered. How do we begin to kind of close those gaps, kind of allow these technologies to be accessible to those who um, need it? So I want to go a little bit about my lab. What does it mean to visualize data pollution? Um, three, two examples, and then a couple of examples of my lab has created. Um, so I look at Mossville and uh, Little Haiti in Florida, two um, communities we're working with, and then two examples that are in my lab um, that we're doing. If you're with me, if you can hear me, raise your hand. All right, we're still there. Thank you. Um, so my lab. So my lab is Core Futures Lab at Harvard University. Core stands for Community-Centered Openness Research and Equity. Um, it's an intergenerational lab of high school students, middle, middle school students, grad students, undergrad students. And I have created a space where you can be from any major. The idea is that earth science or atmospheric science or the sciences that generally have been away from us um, can be accessible to you with whatever major you want to communicate that in, but then that we all, we all, we all creating solutions that are applicable to our communities, right? So it'll be in the language we speak, it'll, it'll look like us, we better hear ourselves in the things that we create. So in the past three years, I worked with three grad students, six undergrad and six high school students. Some have visited NCAR, they came last summer, the picture on the far left, um, some came this summer, and then some NCAR um, staff came to Howard's as well, so that was just great. Um, and at the core of the conversation, the question is, um, and I love this quote um, by record of um, Vera, uh, and I'll go right to the bold part. Um, they said, we're pulling data from satellites all, all over the area, right? Bayou's drafts, weather stations, and a wide range of autonomous sensors, fishing logs, and even social media sites. There's so much data everywhere, but we still have so many problems, all right? So, so, so where do we find the middle ground with so much data, right? But again, some people are still um, not able to grow healthy food. People still have unclean water. Um, energy is still a burden. Um, access is not even accessible. Um, things are not in the right language. And the ability to even attempt to start conversations are not there. The big elf in the room is trust, right? We have all this data, but do we even trust it? Right? Do we believe that it can change people's lives? Right? If I create a whole monitor that can test water and you put on my faucet, will, like, will I drink the water if it says it's, it's good? I don't know. Right? So the, the question is, where do we start to even begin to build trust in our innovations to allow communities to use it that we know it will improve their lives? Right? I think the best example I have is, um, the best example I like to think about is dishwashers. Right? Dishwasher, it definitely saves you money with your water bill, right? But most communities use dishwashers as drying shelves, right? And they rather just wash water manually, right? So you know that the, that the tech is there to help, but the trust also has to be kind of bridged um, to make things move forward, All right? So um, I worked in the past few years, and I'm going somewhere. You know, I like to speak in circles, so I'm not really a traditional researcher. So um, in doing my work, leaving Howard, going to Mossville, going to Hawaii, going to the Bronx back home, going to Florida, staying in D.C. and go to Baltimore a little bit, I've met a lot of people, and some of the questions that they raise are just, for me, shocking, because we have the answers here at NCAR, right? Um, I'm in Mossville, um, I won't say her name, but the first picture on the left, um, they're dealing with a community where you can smell that the air is bad, right? You smell that the air is bad, um, toxic. Um, satellites say one thing, EPA says one thing, but at NCAR, people can create sensors that can inform people, right, what is what you smell, right? Um, how bad is it? What's the concentration? So how do we kind of empower this woman to be able to understand her life situation. Um, in Hawaii, with water issues, right, vegetation, um, and growing food, right, from the ground, sensors, that can be built here, already has been built here. Um, there's enough algorithms to know when, how, how much water, what time to even grow food, right? But communities in Hawaii um, don't have access to that. 
In the Bronx, it's water. In Miami, Florida, it's heat. How do we beat the heat? We have data from satellites, um, data from all over to, tell people how, to, to inform people how, when to go outside, what to wear to go outside, how much the sun will hurt your skin to go outside. But on the same side, do we have enough education for people to be able to have green jobs, right? Because their issue is unemployment. So how do we fill that gap? Then in DC, one of the issues in DC is maternal health, right? But a lot of the maternal health issues is, is deals with food deserts, energy burden, and just access, right? And that is here, right? So we can provide that. So sometimes it becomes burdensome to hear a story from Ms. I say Ms. Carolyn, um, who lost two sisters in two months, right, from cancer, right? Um, we can provide a sensor to allow her to know what's happening with the air, um, but how do we get beyond even that solution, right? To go from tech solution to health to really impacting her life and her family's life, right? Um, so that's where we sit at the middle of. So data pollution is what I um, have been talking about, is this idea that the assumption that data is everywhere, but the reality that data isn't everywhere. And when we have areas of the world where people don't have data and people begin to make up data or interpolate or overlook um, that poor data economy, in many cases, impacts people's day-to-day -day lives, right? For those who aren't counted, for those who um, aren't seen, for those who aren't heard, um, not, having, not having those data points um, becomes very problematic for them to be able to improve their lives. We see that example starting off when I first started in Houston. Um, look at NEXRAD um, satellites and where they are located and population density in black communities. We see that the black areas are high density population black communities. The green circles are satellites. And you can just see from the picture that people aren't covered. All right, so if you're not covered, you're not getting information, you don't know what's happening when it comes to storms, when it comes to weather, and then how do we close that gap? Right? How do we address this when we visually see that there are gaps in the data? Uh, we go to Louisiana, looking at Mossville, the community I work in specifically. Um, Mossville is in the Cancer Alley region, in Cancer Alley, cancer being a part of the title, shows that you know, there are some issues in the area. Uh, so Cancer Alley, if you go to the EPA websites, I will not blame the EPA right now, but the EPA pulls from the state's website. Generally speaking, on many given days, the air quality is good in Mossville. Uh, but again, if you go back to the title of the section where people live, this is Cancer Alley. So how can the data be saying one thing and people be having a totally different lived experience? Right. From the mapping standpoint, when we look at Mossville and we look at what is in the area, um, we can see the community from a um, graphical, graphic point of view. Um, the green dots are the refineries that are surrounding that community. Um, and we see that we know that physically things are there that are dealing with oil and gas. Those things don't emit um, quality air. And if you go to the EPA website, they'll tell you that that is true. These companies are reporting what they're emitting in the air, which is not clean air, um, and then people don't know what and how this impacts their health. But from a dynamic map view, we also know that when you have air issues, um, that impacts people's health. But then with air, we also see an issue with, if someone can point out something that looks very interesting on the picture on the right. If you notice on the left, we see nice colors. On the right, we see brown water, right? Um, so with Air comes water issues, right? I'm sorry, next slide. Here you go, right? So water becomes issues. So the issue of water is just not a Flint issue. It's not a Mississippi issue, not a Florida issue. Um, many communities are having water issues, right? And they can literally see it coming out of their faucet. Do they know what it is? They don't know what it is. They just know that it's not clear. Um, and then when they go ask their officials, the officials will say, it is, it is, it is normal for you to see discolored water, right? From a, from, a, from a scientific perspective, the question is, how do we know what's right, right? We generally would say that is not from the human eye, but even if I test it myself, if I have my own monitors, maybe I can kind of come to a conclusion as far as what's happening. So water is an issue. Air is an issue in many communities that um, data, is an, data is a larger issue, right? From a landscape, um, area perspective and looking at Mossville, 
in the past 10 years, we can see just spatially how much space um, and disruption um, industry has had to the community. Um, people have lost elementary schools, um, cemeteries, they've lost homes to industry. And the question is, what impact does that have um, on these communities? And when I visited Mossville, this was a resident's home. I was standing at their home. And I could literally see across the street, which is a refinery, uh, burning happening there, right? So this idea of, um, of us not knowing what's happening, of us not being able to quantify or collect data, um, that's not true. The question is, where do we find the, the space, the time to be able to understand and provide people this information um, and collect it? So I'm going to jump to also consider what people physically see in Mossville. So from a housing standpoint, um, people are losing their homes or are being forced to sell their homes. So we see the loss of home ownership in the community. And the home ownership is a symbol of wealth. So we see wealth, income, environment all being um, impacted. And the last example I will have is uh, Little Haiti, Florida. So Little Haiti, Florida just came back from there yesterday. Um, and heat is the common issue across the globe. It's getting hotter everywhere, but also it's getting extra hotter in certain places, particularly places where we see um, minorities um, existing. So we've been looking at heat uh, distribution in Little Haiti and figuring out how, how, how much hotter is it getting in Little Haiti versus other communities that have um, better vegetation, better tree coverage, and how we can support their communities. So I'll talk about what we're doing in Little Haiti to kind of bring data to them and also let them create their own data. So we've seen examples of water, heat, air, um, all being related to social issues, right? And the question is, with the innovation we have here, how do we begin to kind of close the gap to allow people to see themselves in the data, use the data for themselves, but also be empowered so they possibly create their own? So in my lab with my students, we've kind of started on the journey as far as the first question with air. And this has been very helpful with Ag and Keith with their project um, on air quality. Um, the monitor started um, with this, looking like this. And now it's kind of been dynamically changed to this house model. So this is kind of the size of the house. And we thought about allowing communities to feel as if clean air was a community home project. Right, so um, we created a um, air quality monitor that looks like a, a house. Um, it has solar panels on the top. It shares the data through a Wi-Fi, um, and it gives a hyper-local reading, right? That community members can know what is specifically at their location. Um, they can share that data amongst themselves, but also looks like the community. So the goal was to have the face be clear, and children can paint it, put stickers on it. Um, it could be there their monitor for their community, for them to be empowered to take control as far as control their data, but also to know and be empowered as far as what's happening in communities. All right, so the first thing we kind of give communities was dealing with air quality. The second we dealt with was heat. So heat in Little Haiti, Florida, you want to be able to measure heat at a hyper local level, at a bus stop, at a school, um, at the field, at the playground. Like, how hot is it specifically at these locations so people can be informed about um, what is happening in their community at a hyper local level, at a, um, also at a real time level, and also at a, at a, in a way in which they can trust it. So we see uh, we drew flags, Haitian flags on these small monitors. These monitors are about this small. So this is the exact size of the monitor. Um, so we want to build trust. We want to build um, accurate data for the community to know, and then allow people to make their own decisions, right? If it's cooler on one park versus the other park in the day, maybe you should go to this park because it's cooler. So now you know that. But being, being able to build trust was very important. Being able to give people access also to the data was also very important. The next thing also is literacy, right? Um, I was working with a team, and they have been working on an algorithm that deals with forecasting and data. And I said, this is all great. But what if my daughter wanted to kind of get involved? Like, how can she learn about it, right? So we thought about creating stories, right, and books for children about um, air quality, right, and about what we're doing, right? So not saying this is an innovative idea to kind of create books, but how do we kind of translate our work to younger children to be able to either get involved, be excited, be engaged. So we did um, add uh, this book to our team 
as well. And then lastly, what we've been working on is something called Cypher, this idea as far as this data commons, where do communities put their data to start with, right? The idea that um, we want to have control over our data, we want to be able to access our own data, and if we want to share with others, we can do that too. Um, so Cypher stands for Communities Yielding Power by Harnessing Emergent Resources. This idea of creating all these monitors that exist, heat, air, water quality, and allowing communities to kind of create their own data commons, where if they want to, they can share with people, or just at least share with themselves, right? So these ciphers will train high school students um, to be able to be data rangers, to be able to collect data, to be informed about data. Um, they'll be able to um, create their own monitors that look like the community, sound like the community, and then people will be empowered to be able to have this feedback loop with um, the EPA says this, but I have that. And where do I kind of submit this new data to be able to inform um, these larger models that exist? So we can be included in algorithms um, and so on and so forth. So for the most part, um, I, I, again, being a part of NCAR has been just mind-boggling, mind just being able to understand models and forecasting and the innovation side. Um, but being able to know that their communities are just not in the data economy or data e ecosystem um, sometimes becomes very tough, right? I remember sitting with a community member looking at the Justice 40 um, map, and their community in the Justice 40 map wasn't included. Right? And that was very hard for them, knowing that that was a place where they felt that they were um, seen, but they weren't even seen. Right? So I close here in saying that um, the, the, the goal in you, allowing community data to be central in our work um, is, empower, is empowering, is much needed. Um, in many ways, in many communities, they are waiting to be engaged, to be able to be seen and heard when it comes to data products. Um, algorithms and technologies, and I just know that NCAR has done so much with the work that I've even seen and done working with scientists here and communities that I know we have so much more um, impact to make at other institutions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. A. And uh, for the folks online, we do have uh, Slido set up, so feel free to type any questions you have, and I'm happy to read them off, um, but we can start and see if there's any questions in the room. Thanks for that great talk. It was really informative, super informative. I, I was really impressed by that changing of the visual presentation of the sensors. I mean, mm. was that, I, I'm just curious, can you say more about how you came across that idea? Was that yeah. inter interaction with the community or whatever? I just, so, I mean, as a scholar at HBCU, coming from the Bronx, you know, researcher, citizen, same person, right? And I, I remember I came last year, it was like exactly last year, I saw Ag and Keith's um, display of their monitor, which is like a long pole, had like a circular, and had like an eyeglass at the top. I said, is that, I said, is that a camera? Like, are you watching me? And the question of surveillance came up, and I said, I love this. It is great, but I'm not putting this at my house. No one in my community will want to see this, so we have to kind of think about how does this look like the community. It can help. It can definitely should be serving and closing a data gap. Um, so the students had like a whole hackathon on the design, and we came with a house model that, um, similar to uh, the, the share books, um, yeah, like, yeah. So that, that is a community thing that people feel like is community, so I do the same thing with air quality. Make this a shared experience where people can kind of know that we're housing our data um, in our community. So, but yeah, that's how it started. I just felt like what, what was being displayed was not something that I would trust. And I think trust is a big elephant that needs to be dealt with when it comes to tech in many communities facing some of the harshest climate concerns. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. A. Thank Could you actually talk a little bit more about that trust building process of like how how and who did you reach out to? How long did that process take of building that relationship, right? Because it's not, it's not enough to just say, oh, trust us. And yet, that's often what science groups do, is go in and say, oh, but we have this great, this great idea. So if you could share more on that process, that would be wonderful. Thank you, thank you, great question. And I think trust is very complicated as a human being, right? And at the same time, they say trust like glass. Like if it breaks, putting it together is very difficult. Right? So for most communities, the glass is already broken. And you could be the most trustworthy person, but putting together broken glass is just going to take a lot of time. 
So for the Moscow communities, it took two years for me to get one phone call, literally. And the one time I did go, after getting, okay, oh yeah, you can come down. She, like, it was like, now we're best friends. But it took literally two years to just get one phone call and then be able to get, um, fly out to speak to the community that literally every day is a question of like, how can you help us? We're thankful that you're helping us. Um, can you do this? Can you do that? But the, the trust took just so much time. Um, and it's still a work in progress, right? Because I'm still a researcher, I'm still in the academy. I'm still gonna write a paper, probably give me promotion. Like, am I, am I still trustworthy when I have those types of things going on in my head? Um, Hawaii, a year, the Bronx. I'm from the Bronx. It took six months for a phone call back, right? And I still went for an email back, and I'm from the Bronx. And I started email. I am from the Bronx. This is my address. Six months for email supply. Um, Florida, I've been to Florida twice. Um, and I met with the community members twice. But with all these communities, too, the ones that I'm not from, my students are from those areas, too, right? So that also closes the gap, that my students are from um, Louisiana, Texas, we went to Texas too, and also DC. And in being in DC, um, saying I'm from Howard helps, but again, it's still a question of how your institution, you know, what's the benefit that you're gonna get out of this project. Um, but trust is key, knowing the fair and care principles out there, knowing that um, we're, we're all human. I think it just becomes very difficult to know that if I create a monitor, if I put it at your house, if you know exactly what is in the air, um, it doesn't stop the fact that the, the, the company across the street is still going to emit poor toxins, right? So then what, how do we close that, that, that reality, which becomes a burden as a researcher? Because I can't change that reality. But I can give you some data that can probably help you do something, but um, the reality changing is the, 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 the difficult part. Um, but trust is very difficult. It does take time. Most people have broken realities with research. Research is a very dirty word for people. Um, and um, I think as a research team, as a scientist, coming with good intentions just helps. Um, but know that no, no, no engagement is gonna be easy. Everything's gonna be difficult. Even if, even if I called on Monday and she said, come on Tuesday, her reality doesn't change on Wednesday if I do come, right? So that's, that's the difficult part of trusting that our engagement, our data doesn't change people's lives many times. It just gives them truth to poor, to bad news. Um, and how do we kind of do, use that to be able to kind of create some good news? Um, yeah. Sure. We have a question from uh, Slido, and this is from uh, Tim Schneider, and he says, thinking about your slide about sustainability science and big data, big data is hugely unsustainable, which seems like a hidden dimension of this issue. Uh, he was curious for your thoughts on that. Yeah, so big data is like, Keyword for like capitalism. That's just like when I hear data lakes, like it just it has an environmental word in it, but it's totally not sustainable. Um, so there's a capitalist extent. So I think when I hear big data, and most institutions are against big data. I think the shift may be let's be hyper local data. That would be the best I think response. Um, but big data is not sustainable. Um, I understand that you need a lot of data to run an algorithm or to run a machine learning model. Um, but again, when your model doesn't include data from a community that isn't covered, then the model becomes useless, useless for certain people. So that itself doesn't make it sustainable or useful um, as a question. But I don't, know, I don't know how we recycle data. That should probably be my, my best response. Like how do we begin to recycle data? How do we begin to not have two researchers from two different states look at the same data point, have their same data leaks, and not know that we're both doing the same thing? So how do we recycle? Like, I'm doing this. The whole world knows you're doing this. And everyone could just use your data instead of us kind of doing the same thing over and over again. I think that would be my response. Like, we need to be recycling that more, or, sh or sharing more, like data comments and sharing. Thank you, and we have another online question from uh, Tammy Reckworth. Um, thank you, this was a great talk. Would you please describe how the community can access the data from the local air quality monitors and heat sensors? Yeah, so there is a whole UX, IX conversation that needs to happen that um, for me, what we're trying to do is create like LLM where people can talk to the data. Because the reality is that my mom will not be able to understand what PM 2.5 is. Right? If I gave it to her, she won't. So the question that she would have, is the air quality good? And the data should be able to tell her yes or no. That's all she wants to know. So I think there has to be a sense of technology that kind of closes the gap, um, that people can, can talk to data. Um, but right now we have data, it's just not reflecting their communities that they can talk to. 
So having filling that gap with their own data and having them talk to that would be the best. But there is a learning curve in the, in the STEM and the science and the numbers and what's important, what's needed, um, what's the threshold for sat um, saturation. Uh, but I think, that, I think there's tech that can help that. Um, having it bilingual, having it um, speak back to you, um, audible, colorful, I think that's all important. Visual, red light, green light, that's all helpful. I think I answered the question. I want to pause for a moment and see if there's any other questions in the room. Hi, right, Dr. Ray. Thanks for the presentation. So I was thinking, you know, this sort of community work and community engagement, how NCAR and the scientists at NCAR can really connect with community engagement, especially through uh, MSI partners like Howard, because one of the big things about um, research institutions is having that representation, but having that representation of people who are from the community. So I guess it's more of a question like, what do you see the Core Futures Lab, how you can, how institutions like NCAR and NOAA and EPA can help support and help grow the sort of efforts that you are working with with Core Futures? Thank you, good question. And um, you know, when you, Keith, and Curtis came to Howard, um, not saying there were a lack of scientists at Howard who look like us. They're, they're definitely there. It's not as robust as, as institutions. But I think the need to say that we know that we just add to that number one, right? So the idea of sharing space, sharing thought, um, being a soundboard with other scientists from different, from Colorado, a Boulder, is just helpful in that sense. Um, so there's not a sense, of, there's not a, there's not a, uh, we're not being, neglectful of what we have, but we know that we need more, right, to fill the gap. Um, but two, um, the infrastructure question, right? So we don't have the infrastructure that um, NCAR has or many other research centers have, that that's just the biggest um, benefit to us, knowing that the infrastructure physically, the infrastructure and in tools, the infrastructure and in knowledge, um, the experience and kind of building infrastructures and putting things together, just having that support system just goes a long way, even in the infrastructure and like filling a grant application. It like just goes a long way in knowing that the infrastructure piece or the lack of staffing piece that many HBCUs have, MSIs have, um, that, that can be filled um, because we have ideas, we have research questions, um, we have students, right? Um, but we don't have the infrastructure to support um, not even a one-to-one -one level, um, the issues that people want to investigate at their, in their communities, right? And um, just knowing that is the big gap that many MSIs have, I think that would be um, something that, you know, we're always looking forward to saying, you coming over, what you're bringing, how do we do this, how did you do that, um, is very helpful to us. Thank you. And we have another online question from Matthias Steiner that reads, uh, thinking about the image you showed about colored water, I wonder how many people at EPA would use that colored water <laughs> without thinking twice about its content or reason for the coloring. You know, the, 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 I, um, it's hard because I think they're like people who have jobs, right? That's a whole other conversation. Um, and then your boss. But the reality is like, how bad does it have to get before we all become, we all agree that it's that bad, right? Like again, Flint is there because Flint was in the media and Flint is still Flint. Like the water is still not clean, it's still not an issue. Mississippi is now, but I don't think we've all come to the common agreement that like this is bad. I think people are saying, oh, that is bad, right? Like that, like that oh, that is bad. But we haven't said like, guys, like this is bad. Like for America, this is a bad look for all of us. So I think that becomes a, um, question when it comes to governance, policy, um, whether it's a religious thing, like, you know, the, 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 the morale of it is, is the hard question that um, we, all, we, all, we all don't have the same morals. I know that part. But I think getting to solutions, it would be helpful if um, all of us agreed that the air quality at this level is bad or the level that the EPA even has for certain areas is not low enough, right? Um, yeah not low enough for us to be able to capture that, how bad it is, even though companies are making money, right? Where do we allow our morals and our pockets to kind of not c conflict each other? Um, but I agree, any human being would be like, this is not white, water is white. Um, and this is, a, this is an issue. Um, and then also a sense of responsibility, like who issues, who's, whose job is to fix this, right? And I think that's the problem that people don't want to, um, 
agree upon, like who should fix it. Should it should be a federal issue, state, local, um, someone's education, it's, it's a scattered plot of issues that no one wants, no one, no one wants to take responsibility for, um, and people are feeling the burden of that. Great question, thank you. And I guess I have one more question. Um, you know, in terms of the communities that you've worked with and you've shown me kind of the five, you know, how, how, do, you ex or how do you expand beyond that and what does expansion look like? Because I think one of the things we always struggle with is we don't want to just, you know, touch these five communities and then move on to the next five. You know, how do you make mm -hmm. those meaningful relationships and actually move things forward with the ones you've engaged with but then as you said too, right, we see all these data gaps, whether it's radar coverage, whether it's something else, you know, there are other communities that, that don't have you know, a faculty innovator collaborator that, mm. that's working with them. Um, how do we you know, truly connect and, and see and hear and actually work with everyone? Yeah, so working with everyone is probably never gonna happen. Right? So I think that's just all agreed that we can't solve everyone's problem. But if we at least agreed upon working with one person problem, we probably get enough done. And I think that's a sense of like, I'm going back to the, um, uh, right, the water issue, right? Everyone knows that, that that is not clean. The question is, who's going to raise their hand and take that as their research pro project, right? Um, so someone took that, someone can take that other that, and then we can probably get two things across the list and then move on, right? But I think many of us are like, oh, that is bad. Let me go back to my modeling and you know, figure something out that can work for everyone. Because I think modeling, forecasting is like this global sense of let's model the air quality for everyone. Let's get the um, satellite readings for the whole globe because it will help everyone. But until we begin to take volunteers for some small projects, um, it, we probably won't get to everyone. But I think we should kind of think about it in that way. And it, does, it takes a lot of work, right? It is not free. It is not emotionless. Um, it is not, you know, there's definitely no sense of a guaranteed solution, right? But I think if we decided to take some of these problems and say we want to think about Flint's water crisis and figure out how we can use radar, uh, satellite, uh, engineering, sensors to fix that, um, we can probably begin to, begin to create inroads in many issues across the globe because they can also be um, 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 replicated in many areas and communities. Hi, I was wondering um, for the Core Futures Lab program, you had graduate students, undergraduates, and high school students. Mm -hmm. What does it look like for having high school students participate? Um, high school students, uh, okay, so they're highly, irresp highly ir irresponsible, I'm saying. Um, no, they're, they're just students. I think for me, when it comes to addressing the climate issue or Earth sciences, I won't see solutions in my time. So the best thing to do is like, okay, this is a problem. You're this young, right? Think of crazy options. Think, think, think of all the crazy ideas we can do to solve this problem that you may see a solution in your lifetime, I may not. Um, and they think of the most interesting things. For the Mossville solution, for the Mossville community in dealing with the petrol petro company, a student said that we should create VR, AR, um, museums of this situation, have people wear glasses and see it, like see what like plumes of smoke look like. Cause most, cause most people don't know what that looks like. And I was like, that's a great idea. Like, so they have some of the greatest, so they have some, some great ideas. Sometimes a little bit off the rails, but again, it's their future. So whatever idea you think is gonna help your friend not go down the same path someone else, like my, my age did go, um, go for it. Um, so it's exciting to kind of hear their ideas. Um, and again, it's their future. I think we should kind of give them space to be able to kind of Share their thoughts, you know. Share their fears. Share their passions, because it is their future. So I, I'm always, I'm always excited working with students, even middle school students as well. Your comment about, if I quoted you correctly, of, you know, research is a bad, is a dirty word, or yeah. something like that. Uh huh. You know, I mean, the reality is that you are an academic. You do have some research academic goals that you have to pursue. Mm. That, and you sort of overlap strongly in research and goals for the, with the community. But there are differences. How do you, how do you work with that in that, that yeah. trust idea? Right? I mean, it's hard. Um, so, for if you looked at all the slides, I don't have any publications. I have a children's book. I have like five monitors. 
I have, you know, high community engagement. I have 10 contacts, people can call me back. But I have no publications, right? Um, how do I reconcile that? Um, I might talk to my chair and be like, listen, this is what happened. Um, this is a situation, it took time. Can you give me more time to write on this? At some time, but I didn't have time to write. One, because the children in these communities, I felt like they would move further if I wrote a children's book. Like I'll make a better impact with a children's book versus a publication. Two, um, a monitor, I think this monitor took us like six months to get to this house version. Literally six months, 3D printing, like 10 different options. Um, and I missed like a conference deadline. Um, the conference can come out again next year. Conferences are not going anywhere, but people's live experiences, those things may change. And one of my concerns with the community in Moscow is that someone may pass away. Like, and, I, and I lose my contacts, so I'd rather put more time and effort in getting these contacts, making change. At some point, I can sit down and write. Does that impact my um, tenure promotion timeline? It does. It does, and I think everyone has to make that choice. Um, but the idea is that, again, some people are trying to go to the, the next Mars. Some people are trying to create a whole other universe. But I'm here. So I have to figure out how to get clean air, clean air for myself, clean air for my daughter, clean air for residents. So I think that's like, how do I create, how do I create something that will impact someone's social behavior that make me live longer alongside trying to get promotions and I can kind of keep my job. But I think that's the balance of like, some of these questions are just like, I want to live a place where I can breathe clean air, I can get a notification about weather, and then I can take some time to write later. Um, but it's very difficult. Everyone is different. Um, I've been funded by NCAR, that was very helpful. Um, but I think it's, it's the academy slowly beginning to see community engagement and different dynamics of publishing um, and community work as um, impactful, so you get an impact score. You can kind of look at tweets, be able to see, oh, my tweet went this far. Um, so things are changing a little bit, um, but it's all still risky. At some time, I'm gonna sit down and write an article. But right now, I have not written one. Am I sad? Maybe a little bit, but uh, I think the goals of letting people see themselves in, their, in the science is kind of fulfilling. Thank you for that question. I guess let me just give you a plug and say uh, papers are coming, though, too. Papers that, are coming, uh, but the way development. looking, Curtis, I don't know. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, one more question from Tim Schneider here. A brilliant presentation. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Recently, in the past couple of years, I've been interested in the intersection of the principles of design and earth system science. You seem to be living at that intersection. What's next for you in this regard, and how can we help? OK. So yeah, so I'm like a mad scientist right now. Like I, my PhD is in African American history. I'm nothing about sensor sorting. None. That. I've been getting a whole street and car degree in like designing science for communities, and it's just it's exciting. Um, 3D printing. I have four in my house. No, really, I have four in my house because I'm trying to understand how to best do it. But um, I think the the technology that we create. When it comes to earth sciences and people's lived experience in the environment, it should look like them. Like it should. Um, if it doesn't, um, in many cases, people don't trust it. If they don't trust it, they won't use it, and then we're back to square one. So how best do we merge climate and culture? So that's where my, my, my new, is, I guess, passion is. Climate and culture, how do we create climate technology that, that resembles the culture? Because the culture, minority, serving, um, bilingual, these communities are facing the harshest climate conditions and they lack access or trust in some climate tech climate, climate, climate that's already out there. So how do we remodel it, recycle it, allow it to look like them so, that, so they can use it and it can kind of save their lives. So climate and culture is something that I'm moving more um, into and then I'm also changing departments too. So I'm leaving history and going straight to earth sciences. Hopefully that goes well. I have to start from scratch for publishing. But um, I'm excited to the challenge. I'm excited for the challenge. So thank you for the question, Tim. And I think um, Chris Rosoff's comment is a good place to end it. Um, and so Chris says, you know, thank you for your talk. More of a comment, I'm sure I speak for others when I say that these efforts are the ones in which many of us here at RAL, and I'll just add across the organization as well, would wish to collaborate you know, even more in some shape or form. And kind of on that end, you know, I wanna say that Dr. A is with us um, through Thursday morning. And so if any of you are interested in you know, joining these conversations, figuring out how we can collaborate more, um, figure out what comes next in terms of 
funding, publishing, community engagement, and all of those good things, um, certainly you know, feel free to reach out to me or reach out to Dr. A directly. And um, if we don't find time this week, we'll certainly find time in the future. Um, but with that, thank you all for attending in person and online. Um, please join me in one round of applause for Dr. A. Thank you. Thank you.